we've got Professor Sean Ulm. Is that how you pronounce your name? Very Apologies. close. It's, it's Ulm. <laughs> 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 Apologies for that. And um, Sean is the Deputy Director for the ARC Centre for Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage at James Cook University. Um, and Sean, you're also the editor of the Queensland Archaeological Research Journal, which is an open access journal, which you're right. going to speak to us today. And also joining us is Associate Professor Kate Galloway from the Faculty of Law at Bond University. And Kate is the chief editor of the open access journal Legal Education Review. Um, so if um, if you're happy, we might kick off with Sean. Is that OK? Sure. Yeah. Just need to try and see how I can share my presentation with you. Uh, okay. Sean, at the bottom of the screen, it should say share screen. Yeah. Can, can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just can't um, project it, so you'll have to put up with the... Um, How's that? So, um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to have a, have a chat to you about some of my views on open access. And thank you for Jackie for putting me forward um, <laughs> to do this. But I'm very, very happy to talk about these issues. And it certainly is a pressing issue for the new ARC Centre of Excellence that I'm involved in as we're developing our own open access policies for our members and we've got about 130 researchers already uh, in the, in the center of excellence so it's a core issue for us and obviously we need to comply with arc mandates but we want to go well beyond those and there's some of the issues i'd just like to briefly canvas with you today um, i do have a disclaimer i am an archaeologist um, so i hope you won't hold that against me but I, I have quite broad publishing experience. I was the editor in chief of Australian Archaeology for six years when it was a professional society based journal and uh, the subsequent editors transitioned that to Taylor and Francis. I was also managing editor of the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education for eight years and I sit on various um, editorial boards of subscription based journals. Uh, but I also um, edit and I'm on the editorial board of several open access journals, including the Queensland Historical Atlas um, and Queensland Archaeological Research, which is the case study I want to talk to you about today. Um, now, with, with this audience, I don't have to do my normal spiel about how lucky people are to access libraries. And, but uh, I, did, I did want to share an anecdote with you. Um, a few years ago when I was at UQ, I, I worked next door to a, a linguist who was a very senior linguist. Uh, and I was having a hallway discussion with her about, you know, how I was concerned about uh, all of our work being um, behind paywalls and how small the potential audience was that was able to access those papers. And she said, what, what do you mean, Sean? Like, you know, you just get on the internet and you can find all of my papers. and she insisted that I follow her to her computer and she logged onto the UQ library and she showed me that she could download her papers and she had absolutely no conception that it was only through her employment at the university that she was able to access those papers. And I think one of the, the barriers for um, advocates of open access and for librarians who are, are trying to facilitate open access is trying to break down those misunderstandings in the research and academic and student communities that you know it's in fact only by virtue of the payments that libraries make and call makes in negotiating these agreements that they can actually access this material and i think some of the lack of momentum to support open access is because we've made it too easy for people to you know access these materials through the library and they take it for granted but my my more immediate um, uh, I, I guess concern is about the ac that academic privilege and that that's certainly part of it but most of my research work is with remote Aboriginal communities in northern Australia and and southern um, Papua New Guinea and you know 
these are exactly you know the, the constituent communities that many of our researchers work with whether they be indigenous communities or other stakeholder communities but these are precisely the communities that are unable to access research done on their own country or or done you know in their communities and i think you know we always need to keep though the those people at the forefront of our minds that these communities we work with whether they be indigenous or otherwise that um you know they're, they're the end point of our research so the, this this is the model that uh, OA twenty twenty would like us to transition very rapidly to, and you know I, I don't have to go into the details here with this group, uh, but of course it involves substi substituting a subscription based model to a uh, an APC model uh, very very rapidly, so that the dominant model is gold um, open access with a minority green open access. Um, I, I have fundamental ethical problems with this mandate because it doesn't fundamentally challenge the status quo and it's effectively simply shifting the money from, from one model to another but leaving it in the hands of multinational uh, companies. And I think even more problematically, uh, unless authors have access to to pay the APCs, and many you know many communities and scholars are unable to find the fees to pay those fees, um, and in fact, even now, as a very well-funded senior researcher, I, I can't make all of my you know twelve or fifteen papers each year open access. It's simply economically unsustainable. And I'd imagine even if we stripped subscription money from libraries and gave them to researchers to manage their uh, APCs, it, it's still maintaining the, the same amount of money in the system. You know, uh, an alternative, of course, um, is, is not to support that model and, and continue to support green open access. And of course, university repositories are a major a piece of infrastructure supporting green open access. Um, but I, I still don't think we're thinking laterally or radically enough to challenge the status quo in that system. And I'm going to suggest to you that this is what we should be aiming for. That, you know, I think the debate has got bogged down in, and polarised simply talking about green and gold open access, when in, in fact, I would suggest that you know, as a researcher uh, whose research is entirely paid by taxpayers, um, and as a researcher whose salary is paid by the university, and as a, a taxpayer-funded researcher who edits journals and, and referees multiple papers a month and proofreads papers, that it's people like me who are actually doing the majority of the background work uh, supporting multinational publishers uh, in, in both gold and green open access models. So the only, the only value adding I'm people like me are not doing is, is packaging that uh, and marketing it. Um, so, so this is where I, I just want to talk briefly about this case study. So uh, Queensland Archaeological Research is a journal that's been published since 1984. So I I was 12 years old in 1984, so I wasn't, wasn't quite around when this journal started, but uh, I started as an undergraduate at the University of Queensland in 1989 when, when this journal was five years old. Uh, so I've, I've been there to close to the beginning, but not, not quite from the beginning. And you can see from the quality of the typesetting that this was done uh, by my PhD supervisor, Advisor actually, Jay Hall was the founding editor of this journal, and he cut and pasted this up on a plane table in his office, like literally using a, a razor blade to cut out the graphics and paste them, uh, you know, to send to the printer. Uh, so it, all of the labour was scholarly done, and uh, those uh, hard copies were then sent to the university printer, uh, who printed the early early versions. The, the journal's now been around for 35 years and it's had quite a, 
a, a stop-start interrupted history. And you can see from this graph simply of the number of pages published each year, it's always been published as one, one journal each year and notoriously it ran late. The volume for you know, 1986 always appeared in 1987 or even 1988 as a single volume. But, uh, you can see it was published continuously to 1992, then there was a bit of a break, a single volume in 1996. And then I got involved in 1999 um, and, and edited the, the three volumes after that based on uh, research and research projects that I was involved with. Uh, but I wasn't involved in, in the um, editorial side of it. And then there was a long abeyance uh, in the early 2000s. So in uh, 2010, uh, UQ decided to install uh, one of the early versions of the OJS system um, uh, created by the PKP uh, Knowledge Project. And uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, Belinda Weaver was uh, the advocate at UQ driving that installation and encouraging academics to, to sign up their journals. And uh, at that time, I was very interested in, in putting my money where my mouth was and getting involved in the open access movement. Uh, and I, I proposed to the existing editor that we transition um, Queensland archaeological research to the UQ installation of OJS. And that was in, uh, the first volume was in 2011. Uh, and it's been published on that platform ever since. Uh, in 2016, I think UQ announced that it was going to uninstall OJS and it was going to no longer support the journals across UQ that were installed on that platform. And happily at that time, uh, Jackie and others uh, were, were pushing to install the new version of OJS at JCU. And we were able to seamlessly transition QAR from UQ to JCU at that time with no interruption to, to publishing. Uh, so that, that's, that's sort of the background. Um, you guys probably already know the background to OJS, but there are a number of alternative open um, publishing platforms available. Um, I've scoped out a few of them, but OJS is the one I'm most familiar with, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I have to say that we've always used it as a content delivery platform. So the back end of OJS uh, allows a, a full uh, publishing workflow system from uh, author submission of papers through to refereeing, uh, page proofing, uh, and a final version publication. And this is what our homepage looks like. And, uh, you know, you can customize this. You can embed it in other, uh, other web pages and, and do other wrappers around it to make it look a lot sexier than this. But I'm a bit of a pedant and I like the plain, the plain wrapper. But we do use it as a, as a content delivery platform and basically paper submission and uh, uh, review and typesetting is all all done offline. Um, I'll just flip back to that but part of the reason for that is I find the back end of OJS quite clunky um, for uh, paper submission and review processes. It, it, you really need to understand it very deeply and it can be, I found it to be a bit buggy. So after a lot of testing, we decided only to use the, the content delivery uh, side of the platform, which works very effectively. And all the other aspects of journal production are done uh, offline by email. So it is a scholar led journal and we've got a large editorial advisory board. So. Uh, every paper is re is reviewed by at least one editor and as as well as three others and those three others uh, are at least partly always drawn from the editorial advisory board but we try and draw in uh, early career researchers and and others uh, where we can and we strive very hard to have gender equity on the editorial advisory board and gender equity and career stage equity uh, amongst those four reviewers that are selected for each paper. So all of the uh, review work uh, is done by the editorial advisory board and the editors. Uh, and I personally do all typesetting um, in Word 
uh, using a, a macro template that I've developed. So, uh, um, so that that certainly is uh, an input cost. Uh, on the back end side of things, the the, the platform is uh, hosted and supported by the JCU library. Um, really with Jackie driving that in this instance, but also with the very able support of David Bierty, who's a IT um, um, development officer at JCU. And the platform needs to be installed and there are, are security um, setting uh, implications that need to be considered, of course, when you're installing a system like this on a university platform. Uh, and also David's been involved in troubleshooting IT issues to get it set up. But once it's set up, uh, it needs to be you know, updated with regular patches for security vulnerabilities, et cetera, like any platform, but it is ably supported. It's all um, open code. So David, in this instance, was able to modify parts of the underlying code to customize it for our needs and troubleshoot problems. Uh, but also significantly, something I was unable to do at UQ, but I was able to do at JCU, uh, we've uh, purchased a subscription to Crossref uh, through the JCU library, and we mint uh, DOIs for each article and each volume uh, of uh, QAR. And of course, I don't need to tell this audience, but this is vitally important for tracking uh, our outputs and for ORCID um, and citation indices, et cetera, as well. So it's a very minimal cost and uh, there was a, a little bit of uh, setup mucking around and I, I think we pay about $200 a year. And at the moment, the editors of the journals on the, the JCU OJS install are sharing the cost of the Crossref membership each year. Uh, to the benefit of everyone. Um, and basically, we're a, we've got the minimum um, Crossref subscription, but we can mint hundreds of DOIs, and, I, and we've actually uploaded the entire back catalogue of QAR and the other journals on the JCU OJS system and minted DOIs for that back catalogue as well. So we're getting a lot more... Um, a lot more coverage for that back catalogue as well. So that... I'm really, really pleased with the way uh, QAR is delivered on the JCU platform and being able to mint DOIs is really the icing on the cake and it wouldn't be possible without the, you know, the support of the library in this case. So the, these are the things that sort of, I guess, the defining attributes of, of how we've approached QAR, but it is library coordinated and I think any effort of this sort can't be atomized across different business units of the university. And I think the library is the appropriate organizational unit for this kind of uh, platform. Uh, you know, these things don't work unless it's scholar supported. Um, and, you know, I guess what I said earlier about people like me doing all the refereeing and editing of subscription based journals. The only real um, uh, leap here is that I'm also doing the typesetting um, and, and the university is, is supporting the very modest infrastructure for delivering this journal. Of course, it's a, a not-for-profit. Um, uh, we're very conscious of uh, making workloads sustainable on everyone involved in the production of the journal. And this is partly why we've got such a big editorial advisory board to, to shoulder that workload. And you can see that in a journal like QAR, we have quite modest copy flow that, but that is building. So, you know, at the moment, we've only got three to five articles being published a year, but we've also got other articles, of course, being rejected, which are sort of the, the silent part of the workload that you don't see in the final product, but uh, are really quantifiable aspects. Now, I think the problem with, the, with uh, these sorts of programs is, if we did deliver a mega journal on this platform, uh, you know, a PLOS One style multidisciplinary journal, uh, you know, the, the workloads in this model, the way we've done QAR would clearly not be sustainable, that uh, you, you clearly couldn't uh, adopt the same, the same model and you would need to devote some institutional support to it. But where this journal is entirely done on a very low budget, the $200 a year is the only direct cost which is borne by the editors of the OJS journals. 
But of course, there are significant indirect costs uh, and in-kind support from the library and IT staff, the editors, the editorial advisory members. But I'd suggest that we're already doing that in-kind support for for-profit journals. So it's simply flipping that over and, and putting the, the means of production in the hands of libraries and, and researchers. And of course, for, a lot, for an initiative like this to, to make sense, it needs to be a sustainable commitment. I have to say I was surprised when UQ announced that they were no longer supporting the platform. And in that announcement, uh, the university librarian didn't indicate that they were substituting it for another platform. They suggested uh, the, the editors of the journals affected seek out other, other platforms to do it and probably others on QLock know more about that than I did do it. So just, just to finish, um, you know, what, where, do I think, where do I think the future of all this is heading or maybe it's my aspirational future of where, where I'd like this to be all heading. I mean, I, I think all of us need to put open access as our core business. And, you know, I'm not just talking about uh, libraries and librarians and research librarians here. I'm talking about institutions and academics and researchers. I mean, I think we, we need not to be shielded from the full reality of uh, globally $8 billion a year going into subscription payments uh, supporting this model. I was very disappointed in the latest infrastructure announcements from the federal government uh, that there, the, there were proposals put forward by the Australian Academy of Humanities to build national infrastructure to deliver open access journals. And unfortunately, I, I didn't see any announcements along those lines. And in fact, most of the uh, money for infrastructure announcements in the humanities and social sciences, I understand, has gone to, to building uh, buildings for CSIRO's botanical collections, which I think are very worthy initiatives, but uh, aren't really directly supporting the humanities and social sciences. And, certainly not addressing this, what I think is a vital piece of national infrastructure. I think, library, I think libraries really need to move beyond a focus on subscriptions and uh, make a coordinated commitment towards supporting open access, not just at an institutional level through things like OJS, which many, many of the members in um, QLOC are doing, of course, but uh, at a national level. And I think pressure needs to be built in call and uh, lobbying uh, federal, the federal government and learned academies that we really need to invest in national infrastructure where scholarly led journals can be delivered in a, in a low cost way. That if we had a uh, very high quality national infrastructure uh, that allowed the delivery of open access journals, I think we would minimize the the time commitment from libraries and scholars and researchers in developing the content and those the, that national infrastructure could be based on an OJS style system but have macros built in for example that allowed um, typesetting of articles etc um, and of course many of these things are done in, being done now in preprint server environments but I think there's plenty of opportunities uh, for uh, at, a, at a national level for leadership to be shown in this space. Of course, I think there needs to be more collaboration with uh, academics and, and researchers, uh, and that's already happening, of course, but I think we need a re-education program for researchers and academics to understand uh, the, the cost models and, and the cost pressures on libraries, and for researchers and academics to understand what they can do in their daily practice to support initiatives towards open access, such as advising their, their students, for example, and leading by example of where they choose to, to place their work for publication. I think all of us need to collaborate with our relevant disciplinary societies. And uh, in my case, the story I started with of uh, the journal I used to edit, uh, Australian Archaeology, that uh, used to be a society published journal, then was uh, sold to to um, Maney actually, which immediately was purchased by Taylor and Francis. Uh, societies like the Australian Archaeological uh, Association, which publishes that journal, 
need to think very carefully when the five-year contract expires, you know, whether they want to continue with that subscription-based model or they want to take the opportunity to, to, re, to revisit that and, and, and perhaps think of alternative models. And I think uh, university libraries have a big role to play in helping to um, collaborate with researchers who are vitally involved in, in producing these journals to make informed decisions about the future of those journals and whether it's to the benefit of libraries and researchers and students to, to leave it in the hands of for-profit publishers. And I think that that's what I wanted to say, but I'm very, very happy to open up the floor to discussion and uh, give my view on any questions that, that the committee might have. Would people like to ask Sean questions or would uh, we like to leave it to the end? Would, uh, we could maybe go to Kate now and then we can have some questions at the end. Would everybody like to do that? Thank you very much, Sean. No problem. Okay, Kate, I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Thanks um, for that, Sean. It really sets the, sets the scene most, most eloquently for things that I have to say. And I, I agree with, uh, with your sentiments and the ideas that you expressed in the end. I'll just give you some background. I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint, by the way. Sorry, everyone. It's just me with the glary background behind me. Uh, uh, the Legal Education Review uh, was set up in 1989 uh, with funding from the Law Foundation of New South Wales. And it now sits under the auspices of the Australasian Law Teachers Association that provides us with um, some money each year to support uh, the, the journal. The journal is not for profit uh, and it's currently being run out of Bond University. Thanks so much to the most excellent work of Antoinette Cass, who um, has facilitated the transfer from the journal uh, from the uh, uh, Western Sydney University uh, to Bond, and it's run now on the Bond's e-publications through B Press for the time being. But there's having just transferred the entire operation from a um, uh, from a, a, a a not online version run by email onto the B Press site. Now Bond is looking at changing to an alternative system. So we'll need to just stay tuned for what happens there. Um, the original model for the Legal Education Review was um, actually hard copy. And the deal was that if you are a member of the Australasian Law Teachers Association, you would get a hard copy. Plus we relied on subscriptions for that hard copy. Uh, but a PDF version was put up online within six months and it was on the Ostley platform within uh, after 12 months. So you got a sneak preview if you were a subscriber and then it was uh, open access, free access online after that. Uh, we've switched over to the fully online uh, model, but we still have, um, we still have some hard copy subscriptions, but each year we're progressively printing fewer and fewer of those uh, as we're trying to educate our readership that it's all going to be available online and we have rolling publications. So as, as a work comes through and it's been uh, reviewed and, and processed and typeset and edited, then it, it goes up straight away. And so that's created some sort of logistical issues for us about how we how we number the issues. I mean, when you have the luxury of collecting them all and then putting them in some sort of logical sequence, you know, like, like the old album, uh, record album, when, and there's something, there's an art to collecting the songs and putting them in a particular order and listening to the album the whole way through. Um, but of course now people want access as soon as things are available and that means that the sequencing in the finished product isn't the same way. So we're still, I think there's a transition period until we get through, uh, through, I'd like to see a position where we don't print hard copy at all and just have fully online. Um, one of the, uh, in terms of the reasons for going this sort of fully open access, I mean, as, as Sean's articulated, uh, I mean, we don't have, um, I think, you know, Sean articulated a, a really clear reason um, in terms of, uh, 
the type of research that's done in the archaeological field with Indigenous people and that sort of thing to have uh, open access. Um, legal education scholars probably aren't in the same um, mould as that, but obviously there are there are other reasons to have it open access. Um, the additional it, it's really that idea of sharing research. We're already paid as researchers. We need to have that um, that research made available. Uh, and the other benefit of going to a fully online model also um, lay with uh, the capacity to track metrics and to have the link to the alt metrics. And uh, each author has a dashboard to be able to understand um, who's looking at the works, how many downloads and all that sort of thing. And I've been playing around in that space for some time now myself. It's a double-edged sword, so I like to use the metrics when it, when it suits me. Usually when I'm talking to people in the institution who don't actually understand what they are, but it sounds nice that you've had, I'm in the top 10% of the SSRN downloads this month or whatever. Um, and I know that that's because my mother has sat at home clicking refresh on the SSR. You can't actually do that. It tells you to stop after a while, FYI. Um, so, so, but now institutions are starting to look at those sorts of metrics. And I, I suspect that that's dangerous because I know that it's a game that you play. But um, those are things that we need to think about because I think those are some of the some of the consequences of going open access are that it will affect the way that our research is measured in the institutions and that can be both a good thing and a bad thing. So, and I don't think we have, I don't think we've thought through some of those implications quite yet. Um, the, uh, the, in terms, so one of the things that's also happened in going to, and Sean showed you, you know, screen grabs of those, those back end uh, sort of processes. One of the, it's, it's been challenging, I think, for us as an editorial committee. So we have an editorial committee of about 10. Uh, we have an, an external advisory board as well who we can call on. We used to have every article was fully read and vetted by the entire editorial committee and we all shared our views before we actually went to the stage of accepting that work. Um, and, it, oh, my gosh, like terrific collegiate work, but it really meant that things were very slow. We've expedited that now. Um, as the editor-in-chief, normally I'll um, vet things that come through. I normally seek the feedback of at least one, sometimes two other members of the committee before I make a decision about whether to accept um, or reject. If I accept the article on its face value, I send the abstract out to the committee to um, see who wants to be the consulting editor, and then they shepherd the process through. Uh, so we get external reviewers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the things that's been lost in that process, I think, is that sense of collegiality amongst the uh, amongst the committee, which uh, I think um, I found it tedious and too long and annoying and I wanted to make the process more efficient and in doing that I realise now that we've lost something of value and it's a question of how we manage that into the future so that's something that we're going to be looking at uh, at our next uh, at our next meeting. Um, the uh, just having a look at where we go now what we don't have at the moment is DOIs and that is not such a big thing in the context of uh, legal research because most of the um, mainstream legal research um, uh, journals, uh, university uh, with law reviews, certainly in Australia, and um, Thompson and Law Book, uh, law book uh, who's the other one, LexisNexis, they don't use DOIs. So, and our um, referencing system, the Australian Guide to Legal Citation, doesn't have provision for DOIs, although we're waiting for a, for a new um, version of that to come out soon, which I'll mention in a minute. So, because we're not accustomed to using DOIs, we don't know what we're missing. And this says something about the state of uh, research in the discipline of law and its adjunct um, legal education. 
So, uh, but that's something also I think at, at Bond we're looking at um, the capacity to be able to mint DOIs. And so there's actually an educative process involved in that. I'd like us to really lead in that and to educate our um, legal research scholars uh, in that regard. Um, I did mention the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Now, in, in light of the move to open access, our commitment to open access, um, the repository infrastructure that Sean mentioned earlier and with which you're all familiar. Um, my colleague Melissa Caston and I wrote an article last year uh, that we published in the uh, in Legal Information Management, which is run through Cambridge University, um, on uh, re-evaluating legal citation in a digital landscape. Because one of the consequences, I think, of moves to open access and all of the models it encompasses, which includes the move to open access repositories, preprints, postprints, is what are, what are we working with? What's the final version? What's the authoritative version? And lawyers are really big on authority and we've got things, uh, I mean, the Ostley versions of case law and legislation aren't the proper authorised versions and yet they're freely accessible. So we have questions of authority which aren't necessarily grounded in, in um, any real authority but which we are accustomed to using because of what happened in, I don't know, the 1400s or something. So, and I think this is extended to, uh, to journal articles and even book chapters that you can now get online and you can, are available in repositories. And this is something that uh, Melissa and I tried to grapple with in, uh, in our model for legal citation and recognising also that there's different levels of research. If you're an undergraduate researcher um, and you don't have, if you're, if you're researching as an undergraduate law student and you find something in a repository that's a preprint or a postprint, how do you make an assessment of whether that's value, valuable or, or authoritative, um, especially if you don't have access to the paid version of that? as opposed to a PhD student, as opposed to a barrister who is submitting something to a court. There's a whole range of um, contexts within which research takes place where we need to think about the value of these things. And so I think this, this then ties in with this commitment to open access and what kind of open access we're talking about, whether we're talking open access for the journal itself, open access for our individual works, through repositories and whether they're pre or post prints and what that means about their authority and their standing and their prestige and their impact. How we measure impacts when our, uh, when our works are scattered across repositories so we can talk about metrics. Uh, we can talk about the alt metrics count that we get from um, the journal site itself but then we also have to recognise someone else is downloading our stuff from my institutional repository, someone else is getting it from SSRN and I'm also on academia.edu. I actually sacked them, but I'm still on SSRN even though it's owned by the bad guys. Um, uh, and, and so I think these are other questions that are arising in the context of open access that we haven't yet grappled with. Um, I'm going to say really, really cheekily that the Australian um, Guide to Legal Citation was meant to have its third edition out in the middle of last year. Melissa and I sent uh, our article or a draft of our article to them and, um, or, or to the University of Melbourne Law Review actually, and which didn't want to publish it. But um, we didn't hear anything and then we heard that the, um, uh, that the third edition was going to be delayed. And then we published, uh, we blogged our piece and then we heard further that it was going to be further delayed. And then our piece came out in the legal information management and, it, and it, it's attracted quite a bit of attention. And we still haven't seen the third edition of the um, Australian Guide to Legal Citation. And we're secretly hoping that we've disrupted the whole system and that they're sitting there going, oh my God, now we don't know what to do. And, and anyway, but we don't know. That's just, that's just us imagining massive impact for our, our modest attempts to raise some of the issues with, um, with open access in terms of citation and what is authoritative. Um, I think the, um, so 
I'd like to pick up too on Sean's point about all of the labour that we're investing um, as academic. I don't mind investing that labour if it's part of what we do, but I have a real objection with people monetizing that um, in the corporate context and then selling it back to us. And I think related to that is the issue that I lightheartedly averted to earlier on with the, um, the so-called free repositories now, um, ssrnacademia.edu, ResearchGate, uh, using our data, so they're not charging for the, um, for the so-called product, that we are the product in what we invest in those. So we're not only doing all of this labour in terms of writing the articles, reviewing them, Sean does the typesetting. I don't typeset, but I do proof and, and edit. Uh, and, um, and now, as researchers, as we, as we are required by our institutions, and some require um, submission to, say, SSRN, others just require to university repositories, all of, there's all of that data upload, which is a cost too, I might say, uh, but we are the data now. We are the product of these institutions. And I think with the big publishers, so um, notably Elsevier, which has been quite aggressive in the marketplace, they're looking at these models. These are the new publishing models. I think that the, the old um, journal as we know it, or even, even what I see in law through Thompson's and LexisNexis, which is effectively content delivery systems, I think. They're databases and they're, they've got a paywall. It's not like Taylor and Francis. You can't even see the abstracts unless you can pay to get behind the paywall for the law journals. Um, I think Elsevier's move into uh, these, these so-called repositories is that's where the future lies. It's going to lie in understanding the underlying data infrastructure. And I don't quite know what it's going to look like in the future, but I'm not convinced that the, how we imagine the future of publishing is going to be the way that it actually pans out. Um, except that we'll all be exploited. I just take that, I just take that for granted. Um, so uh, I think, you know, there, were, there was a comment in, in the chat um, on here earlier on about how, w how we make these changes. And I think really universities need to take charge. I think the fact that universities buy into these measures of prestige, um, some might say it's government-led and that certainly government is complicit in this, but the universities themselves, I think, need to take the lead here. Gosh, you know, we're institutions that are meant to be able to think critically about things and to develop new ideas, and we need to be looking at the nature of information, the nature of scholarship and its presentation, and how we can engage... Um, it sounds big, but the world in, in our research in ways that are equitable and just. And I don't know that we've done that. And I think universities have become tied up in these measures of impact and prestige in ways that predicate against true open access and that in fact support uh, the, the marketization of not just our research, but our work more generally in a way that predicates against a true open access. And that would be my call. Um, it's going to require information professionals uh, and um, organisational management, I think, to be able to move this. But it's, I think it's organisational professionals like, like everyone here who are really going to be at the forefront of these ideas. And that's probably where I'd end it. I think you're muted. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for those presentations.
um, some incredible insights and certainly a lot of things that I hadn't thought of. Um, we've got a few minutes for some questions, so can I open it up? We might go to the people in Zoom first, if anybody's got some questions. Maybe give us a wave first so we know. That's Jackie. Oh, Jackie. Yeah. Hi, Carl. Um, so a question for both Kate and Sean. Um, thanks, first of all, for such great presentations and hopefully it really helps us to move things along at the uni level and the library level. Um, so a practical question to help move things along. Is the platforms that you use a part of the hindrance in moving open access forward or is the whole process of managing a journal through the, the editorial process, the review process so big that the platform itself is not a big issue? Do you want me to answer that, Kate? Yeah, I, look, it's a good question, Jackie. I think, you know, one of, one of the issues, and Kate alluded to this, is you know, workloads um, and that academics and researchers are very familiar and, you know, expect to be doing review and editorial tasks. Although I say that with a note of caution that um, I've just come off uh, four years on the ARC College of Experts and now I'm on the ARC ERA Research Evaluation Committee. And one of the, you know, one of the concerns raised often in those settings is that there's a, a reluctance of people to sign up as reviewers. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I see this in my own discipline that sometimes trying to get a reviewer for an article or a grant, um, pe you know, people literally turn you down, you know, and uh, I'm always shocked by it. Um, and uh, I think we don't incentivize that. So I think there's a couple of things going on here. Obviously, it's it's not it's not a straightforward landscape. But I, I think universities have never been good at recognising that service academics routinely do for refereeing articles or grants. Or so you know we've we've actually been the victims of our own success. I think that we're we're training a whole lot. Of, we're, we've metricized everything, as Kate alluded to, and. Like Kate, I play that same game using the metrics when it suits me and ignoring them when it doesn't suit me. But, you know, unfortunately, this, this is the world we live in and many researchers are playing that game and they're saying, well, you know what, uh, spending half a day refereeing that article is not going to show up on any metric. It's not going to give me any workload relief from my teaching, so why should I do it? So I think the, there's some underlying questions here. The other thing is, like uh, professional staff and library staff, academic workloads are under a lot of pressure, particularly uh, early career researcher and mid career researchers. So there's kind of there's a barrier there in terms of capacity. And I want to I want to give you a, a like an anecdote that happened to me recently, where you know we're setting up a seven year ARC Centre of Excellence. We've got. $44 million to spend over seven years uh, in a particular topic area. And I, I put on the agenda early on that perhaps this was an opportunity to uh, develop an open access journal, uh, a multidisciplinary journal in this space. And, you know, there was a, a distinct lack of enthusiasm for the idea amongst the senior researchers involved in the Centre of Excellence. And, the objections basically came down to three things. I mean, many, many people weren't interested at all. Um, uh, the second set of objections were about workload, like how, how could we possibly fit that in? And the third set of objections were, you know, what happens at the end of seven years that, you know, what would be the, you know, sustainability model for the journal? So I think there's a whole, to answer your question, Jackie, I mean, you know, there's not one single barrier, there's lots of impediments, but I think, you know, a core impediment that's actually relatively easy to address is, is to create some national infrastructure in this space. And, you know, practically, I think uh, individual libraries through their membership of call and call in lobbying Universities Australia 
and Universities Australia lobbying, the, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth. Um, you know, I think that's the level it needs to happen at. I think we do need coordination in this space. And I think any local efforts we might do uh, are always vulnerable to budgetary pressures or key staff members like Kate and I moving on uh, may actually be the end of some of these particular journals or or key research librarians who've really promoted open access in their institutions. We need to think about succession planning for, you know, the investment we make both in libraries and academics. And if we don't have that succession planning, we lose any forward momentum we might gain. If I could just add to that, I think that, um, and I, I endorse what Sean says, but I'd note also that we're talking about this existing model of peer reviewed journals as kind of a gold standard, if you like. Um, so, I mean, part of the, part of the challenge to the existing um, uh, hallmarks of quality is, lies in the accessibility of publication to anyone now. And as someone with a blog who blogs now less frequently than I used to, I found that a really good way to get feedback. Feedback, review, ideas are out there. Certainly I mentioned that Melissa and I posted our site, we wanted to claim the space and we posted our citations ideas up on, up on a blog uh, before it was published. We wanted to get them out there. We actually got feedback from people. We had a pre-review process, process before we actually submitted the article to see whether the ideas would work, what people thought of them, whether they were palatable. So there are other ways, I think, Jackie, in which we can overcome. I don't think that the publication, all of this process and this automated process is an attempt to, is a Fordist attempt to, um, to automate what had previously been done in the analog space, but that digital publishing platforms, everyone's got a platform now. I mean, there's some terrific threads of research outputs that occur in Twitter that, that engender enormous discussion both with experts and the general community. And I think that in terms of what we understand research to be or the, the publication or presentation of research, I think we need to be thinking far more laterally about forms that this takes and how we understand notions of expertise and how we test ideas uh, in, through publication and what publication means. And I don't think we need to be limited to ideas of, um, of the idea of a journal, even because I think that, I, I think we're a bit constrained by that. And institutions need to be more alive to this too, I think. Thank you. Uh, we might have time for one more question. If anybody, maybe we'll, anybody in the room? Um, hi. Uh, it's not really a question. I just wanted to, from a librarian's point of view, just talk about um, infrastructure and the idea of a, a national infrastructure for journals is, you know, quite a nice, a nice idea. But what we probably have to work with what we've got at the moment, which is we've got a national infrastructure really of different repositories at, at all universities, and our journals. Um, uh, indexed into our repository and into the catalogues and um, you know working with DOAJ is an international infrastructure that helps the prestige you know it shows quality of uh, open access in journals and also um, bond our, a lot of our bond journals are also uh, recognized for the era process so they're in the era list so if, as librarians we can sort of push in all those directions to make sure that you know they get as much sort of exposure as possible, and you know to to help with uh, keep the quality up there as well. Thank you. Okay, any more questions before we say a final goodbye to Sean and Kate? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Sean and Kate, um, on uh, behalf of QLOC, um, to, to say thank you for presenting today, um, QLOC will be making a donation to the Indigenous Literacy Fund.
on your behalf. Oh, excellent. That's right. Yes. Um, and uh, but we'll send you details about that later. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank have, you. A, have a good thank meeting. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks today. very much. Bye bye.